The virtual CISO moment is brought to you by VCISO Services, a leading provider of quality and experienced virtual chief information security officers for small and mid-sized businesses. Check them out at vcisoservices.com. Hi, I'm Greg Schaefer, and welcome to the Virtual CISO Moment. We've got David Leach with us today. He is a VCISO with Virtual Clarity and a proprietor with Inspar LLC. Thank you so much, David, for joining us today. Well, good afternoon to you, Greg. Thank you for <laughs> inviting me. It's been a few weeks since we managed to uh, get this in the calendar, so um, looking forward to our conversation. Indeed. And and when you said good afternoon, I just realized it's like, yeah, I think this is the first time I've recorded one of these in the afternoon. I usually do them like early in the morning and and, and I'm still drinking coffee, although it's decaf. So <laughs> I guess that's OK. Um, well, again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, could you step us through like your your past history? I know you've got an interesting history on how you first started in IT and InfoSec and then kind of bring us along to how you got to where you're at today. Yeah, certainly. So I'll, I'll I'll keep it at the cliff note. So I'm a 20 year veteran in the British Royal Air Force, and I had the pleasure to serve both as a communications electronics officer and in the intelligence business. And uh, somewhere in the middle of there, I was uh, you know a crypto custodian looking after paper tape and, uh, and and big horrible encryption devices, and then latterly moved into information operations and information warfare. So I guess you could say that was my start in the uh, in the security business, and uh, yeah, I, I've been really fortunate. I've spent as much time now outside of the military as I as I did inside, and I, I've worked for companies like uh, you know, Accenture and Reed Elsevier. So I, I again split my time between sort of enterprises and um, you know sort of consultancy, and over the last four years I've pivoted into this virtual CISO world um, where I've been even more fortunate to help a number of clients, both some, some large international banks, um, investment banks, and also some smaller startups with setting up their security, let's just call it the security apparatus, um, as they begin to transition and harden their operations um, to deal with the modern world that we sit in today. And, uh, you know, it'd be great to share some of my lessons because I've seen some of the big boys um, be as badly prepared as some of the smaller um, organizations. So uh, for those of you in the uh, smaller uh, size enterprise or small, medium sized business, um, don't be afraid. Um, very, very few people are doing this really well. So um, be great to share some of that with uh, you and your audience, Greg. Yeah, I would definitely like to hear some of that. I, I'm, I'm curious, um, there's there's a lot of folks that are ex-military, and thank you for your service. Different country, but that's still fine, still fighting for freedom. <laughs> so, but I uh, appreciate that. But uh, do you see like a, um, um, a commonality among how the military mindset translates into information security? Because like I said at the beginning, it's like, it seems like that there are a lot of folks that started I'm I'm a former um, U.S. Air Force myself, uh, although I wasn't I was a mechanic. Um, but but I've seen some of the discipline and the of and the process thinking through the issues and the teamwork that have translated over. Have you seen anything like that? Uh, I have, and I, I'm I'm actually staggered by how many of my colleagues, um, you know, from different parts of the engineering world in the Royal Air Force, and also my colleagues that I've met in the United States Air Force. And by the way, I spent more oper- more time under operational command in theater under U.S. control than I did under British control. So um, very closely aligned with, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, with our colleagues in the United States Air Force. I, I think it's really part of the training. We're trained to look holistically at any issue or problem. I don't want to get too closely wrapped up in what we mean by an issue or a problem. Mm-hmm. And we're trained to look at that and to really understand where you can pull levers to reduce and change the risk and the, and, and the outcomes. And we spend a lot of time thinking about and studying what our adversaries do. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, all of the tactics and trials comes from understanding your adversary. So I think that and that end to end thinking portrays very well into you know, understanding risk, knowing or, or being able to assess where to apply the best dollar for the for the best return. And intrinsically, most certainly commanders in the military 
are trained with a risk model. Mm-hmm. They might not call it a risk model. You know, it might be a war game that predicts outcomes, but it's actually a risk model. So when you pull those three things together, I think that's why it becomes pretty um, common that ex-military officers, senior NCOs, um, whatever label you want to put on those junior leaders, do really well um, you know, in the cyber or IT security space. And of course, there's a work ethic that goes along with that as well. So you know, everybody knows that. Um, but that, mm. that's why I look at it. And, and yes, it's I'm, I'm just staggered by how many of my colleagues are, are, are in the business, either as CISOs or in consulting or advising the government on you know, kind of how to secure you know, sort of uh, you know, government operations. Yeah, it, it it is. There is a lot that translates. And you you mentioned before about um, uh, stories that you have learned as you've done gone through. You you've been doing the VC sewing. I, I think I coined that term. I don't know, maybe not. Um, you know, but I like saying that um, for about the same amount of time. And I'm kind of intrigued. Usually at this point in time, we'd start talking about small and mid sized businesses threats. But I'd like to hear a story. A story. Oh my yeah. goodness. Um, so I, I really don't know what's the story you want. If you want me to go off, off, off the beaten track and tell you about a time in Iraq, um, I was in the command center and I well, kind of but, said, uh, and uh, said, stop bombing. And, uh, <laughs> before, before we knew it, um, I was in charge of the, of the transport and communications ministry in, in Iraq under the, uh, under the American control. And yes, even there, it was a risk management around, okay, where do we put the effort to bring those networks up to be able uh-huh. to connect, you know, sort of Iraq. So that's a an off the off the cuff story. And, uh, you know, we can talk more about that over a beer sometime. Well, but actually, I was, th- I was actually thinking VCSO stories, but yes, I, we could definitely I, talk about I, that. I gathered, I gathered that. So I thought I'd bring us back onto track. <laughs> that's so, okay. um, VCSO stories that are, um, that are interesting. I, a lot of these aren't aren't, aren't so much fun as, as that one, um, but I think you know, a, a good story would be client very close to releasing a major new product. Mm-hmm. You look at the backlog of stories that are in in this case it was in Jira, but whatever your your tool is that you're using those, and you suddenly realise that basic hardening has not been applied in a rigorous way and that humans are manually configuring assets where they should be being deployed through code. And you go, oh my goodness, this is so vulnerable that your basic server patching isn't being done. And this is a internet facing um, you know, finance application. And, and you immediately go into shock and panic because you're the guy that's got to somehow tell the story around why should we stop why should we just slow down a little bit and manage some of this risk and so you know my, my predecessor had tried that and had just been steamrolled um by the cto who had a product to deliver on a on on a date so took a step back and went okay we need to characterize this risk and so very quickly built a simplistic fair risk model to show the number of stories and the risk reduction that they could create Mm -hmm. and then start to circulate that through the executive team so that they could actually understand what was needed and we could decide where we needed to get to before that product was released and you know through doing that that product got released yes it was a month later than they'd wanted to do it but it got released in a secure enough manner that the risk was acceptable to the organization and they could actually understand that risk. So if anybody's in that position, fall back on some some rigor in the risk management space to A, really understand what should come first, what should come second, and B, help tell the story at an executive level in in a language that they understand in terms of, you know, dollar impact to, to the bottom line. So that's probably the kind of a the, the scariest moment that I was in as a as a VC. So big big breath. Okay, how do we stop this project and slow it down a little bit? Um, although it was a central project for the organisation. How do you think that 
is um, this happens like the root cause. Uh, I think that you 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 were you were talking a lot about uh, not sufficient risk management processes with a lot of these small and mid sized businesses, and apparently, especially like startups that are really trying to um, go to market with what they're doing. Um, do you think that that's the root cause of this? That because you, you, you know one of the truths in information security is that you don't want to bolt it on a product at the end. You want to bake it in from the beginning. Yeah, I mean the, the root cause, to be honest, is you've got to get product to market and you've got to get your revenue stream going. You can't afford to actually sit back and and make a a robust product that is free of all risk. It, it just is it irrelevant. And the company will have a cash flow problem and you know the backers will drop out and, and, and elements won't go to market. So I've helped a couple of startups in this position. And it's about when do you pivot and start to think a little bit more strategically around managing that risk. Um, you know, the more mature, better funded organizations, they have a, a, a something that they're modeling. So they'll take NIST or you know, CSF or they'll take NIST. 853 and they'll say okay that's our target help feed in those requirements into the build cycle but all of them are at a point in their early days where stuff is getting deployed in a ad hoc way based on best judgment and it's only when you get to a perhaps a I don't want to put a dollar figure on it but you get to a point of maturity where the company has survived perhaps its first two years when it becomes the right point to actually, you know, sort of invest in a little bit more rigor and a little bit more, um, you know, sort of security. And those, the, those small, medium sized businesses that are in the, um, the IT space, they'll be a little bit more forward leaning and they'll know a little bit more around what good looks like. And so, you know, what I, what I see is, is those companies start to think about automation, start to think about pushing configurations as code, start to think about hardening scripts, not hardening manually, start to think about test-driven deployment so that they remove that sort of chance of misconfiguration or at least begin to manage that earlier in their life cycle. And I think you know, one of the things that you know, many people you know, on, on your show talk about as being a you know, really big risk to, to, to any size company is the kind of you know, the ransomware, whether or not it's the ransomware and, and deny, the kind of hack and deny model um, you know, where they lock your systems down or the hack and release model where you know, you'll be hacked into, they'll pull some, some data and then they'll extort you on the threat of releasing your crown jewels or your your employee data or your um you know your your uh your, your business data those are really very valid sort of you know sort of risks but what i see more and more in the small medium sized um, space is an increased use of you know SaaS platforms infrastructure as as services whether or not that's google or alibaba or you know or azure or, or AWS, of course. Um, and so, you know, a lot of that risk now is coming from individuals not taking enough care and attention over correctly configuring those platforms so that they are, are secure. And of course, <laughs> the, the other funny thing is I have no end of, uh, of, of clients who the senior folks say, well, I'm buying this service from any one of those hyperscale providers. Um, they're making it secure for me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've also had people say, I'm buying from these hyperscale providers. I'm going to get better availability, aren't I? Um, and and so there's an education there around, you know, you'll be familiar, Greg, with, you know, the shared, shared um, responsibility model. Yep. And, and, and all of these providers have this. So, you know, they're responsible for the core hypervisor, for the core infrastructure. They will be doing some monitoring on your behalf around, um, you know, command and control networks and people scanning your infrastructure and they'll be telling you about that. But you're responsible for ensuring that you don't place a confidential asset into an S3 bucket that is publicly facing or as some service providers did a couple of years ago, put some keys into an S3 bucket that was mm -hmm. you know, publicly facing and was 
was discovered within minutes of that mistake having been made. And so, you know, that's the pivot point. Okay, when do we start to really think about doing this properly as code and securing the, the configuration to leading, I like best practices, but I know that the term best practices has been a little misaligned, but yeah, leading practices appropriate for the for the size of the organization. Well, there's certainly that 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 risk management is sometimes more of an art than a science. I mean, even if you're doing a quantitative with FAIR and all of that, it's not strictly quantitative. You still have to make some obsession uh, 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 assumptions and there is some objectiveness to that and all that or subjectiveness. Um, but I think you brought up something very important that sometimes people, particularly early in, in information security and cybersecurity and risk management, don't really get. And that is, I, I, I think I'm going to quote Voltaire, I might be off with this, but the perfect is the enemy of the good, where you get a lot of folks that are new to cybersecurity and information security, and they just are aghast at the fact that management, they're so stupid, they're letting this thing go. And we told them that they still have these potential vulnerabilities and all that, but they don't have that risk management mindset. And so I struggle with how can you effectively train or instruct uh, some of those who are newer to the field in in the in the art, if you will, of risk management, because ultimately that's what it's all about. Any ideas there? Um, I don't have a magic bullet. I think nah, I was hoping you did. <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. I, I I probably wouldn't be talking to you if I did. Would I? I'd be kind of running a business with this magic bullet that would kind of <laughs> solve, solve world hunger around skills. And I, I think you know you you talk about it a lot online around the massive experience you need to balance all these things doesn't come instantly. And I think perhaps, you know, setting that, that, you know, it is all right to be wrong and to, 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 to not know how to deal with things. Um, mm, absolutely. It's going to take you some time to build the, the knowledge. And, you know, I, I certainly get to points where my problem solving approach is a, uh, is a, is a pencil, uh, an A3 or a, or a legal pad and you know, a mind map because I regularly don't know what the answer is to a particular piece. So I think sometimes showing people what I do, or, you know, how to solve a, 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 an issue or come up with ideas, um, teach people different um, techniques for breaking problems down and coach people with, hey, had you thought about this? Had you thought about that? I spent quite a lot of time um, in small groups with, you know, kind of the IT security person, helping them interact with, their colleagues in the coding department or in the infrastructure department around you now you can't say no you've got to say how about this and when mm -hmm. you say no you need to be absolutely certain that that risk is unpalatable to you know to 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 the company so let's think about that a little bit and go and talk to the cto and see if he's going to back us up when we say no because there's nothing worse than saying no as a security guy and then getting overruled by the, by the business um, piece. Or, or potentially even worse than that is a security guy saying no to the business. And then the business unit decides to figure out a way to do it anyway. And they do shadow it. And then you have a whole bigger problem that comes up because another truism in information security is you can't secure what you don't know about. Well, you know, the security guy said, we can't do this. So, but we have to do it for the business. And you got, you hit the nail on the head as far as the experience needed in order to get this holistic high level view. And one other thing I wanted to touch on that you said, it, it, and I was thinking silos in IT. I grew up in IT in the networking side, and it took me several years to really care about what database was doing, what systems was doing, what business applications were doing, and even what the CEO was doing. In my my world, I, I you know it was just networking, and I didn't realize just how much it's important how everything dances together. I mean, on the surface, I did. I, I could answer any question with the right answer, um, but I didn't really believe it and feel it. And I think probably took about five, six, seven years into my career before that really started to come up. Um, so for those folks that are are looking for shortcuts, I think that in the end, it's going to come back to to be a real detriment to them. So that's 
I, I guess maybe you and I are in agreement at the, the very least, coach them to understand the idea that there are no shortcuts that you have to put in the work. So, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the term, what about five, perhaps 10 years ago was business aligned IT. Um, you know, because IT had become such a, a, a no, no disrespect, a geek, a geek shop that made smart things, but you know, really was irrelevant to the, to the business. I think those days have long gone by, um, you know, you get still get pockets of that going on. Um, but I think just the, the economic and financial pressures on, on teams now has kind of blasted that out. But being understand you know, what is it, what is it that you're trying to achieve from a business perspective? is really critically important to make those risk-based decisions. Um, you know, because if you're going to stop something which is the lifeblood of the company, you've got to have a really good reason for, for doing that. Um, you know, one of the interesting things, um, I've been doing some work with some venture capitalists, um, you know, sort of funding agencies. And I thought, oh, they're going to want to put risk management across their portfolio of companies. And then um, you know, after a couple of conversations, I had a, a light bulb moment and, and it was no, they really don't need rigorous risk, risk management in a, in a, in a, you know, an A-class funding scenario. They're actually willing for that funding to fail and they don't want to spend on, 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 on the risk at that point in its life cycle. And, and that was an eye opener for me, even given my, 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 you know, my history here in risk management that, yeah, yeah, they, they actually want things to move quickly. So that's another indication of you've got to get the right timing, the right amount of rigor in the right industry and the right life cycle you know, from a, from a company perspective. And, and you have to spend the time understanding the business that you're working for, I think, as well, too. You, you have to have that holistic understanding, even if you're not responsible as a CISO for, for securing all the information across the environment. It still behooves you, even as a coder, to understand not just the what you're doing, but the so what or the why you're doing it. So, well, InfoSec cybersecurity can certainly be a very stressful field. And I'm curious, what do you do to step away from it? Or do you step away? Do you live this 24 by 7 by 365? Or is there something that, some way that you're able to shut down and decompress? Yeah, I, I learned a long time ago in my military career, you know, on active duty that, you you at some point you you run out of you run out of juice you your triple a cells kind of um fail you so i've made a conscious effort to step away and take time off and uh, if you look over my shoulder there one of the ways i enjoy that is uh, is through kayaking on white water mm -hmm. and so um you know i was away this weekend uh, many of your listeners will be familiar with the golly a new river in in west virginia so i, I threw myself down there with a bunch of my uh, close friends and uh, you had a hoot navigating the uh, class four and class five white water. So I, I do that during the summer and the and, and, and the edge seasons. And I love to ski in the winter. And then I've got a family that keep me busy for uh, for, for when I for when I'm <laughs> when I'm not doing those things. So no, I I I, I certainly have have ways of of, of staying of, of getting out of the office. And I think like you, um, you know, I I work out sort of three times a week. Um, I have to say that. I think it's probably so I can carry on doing the kayaking and the skiing rather than from a love of working out, um, you know, my rowing machine and my, um, you know, my cross, my cross trainer um, don't really excite me as much as getting out in the mountains. <laughs> well, I have to admit, and this is the first time I'm going to admit this publicly here. I've, I've said it to people um, privately before, but, you know, I talk a lot about fitness and all of that. And I am going to be doing a half marathon this weekend. It may be my last one. I don't know. I might be retiring from running. But I, I'm pretty vocal in that the, although like I said, I don't think I said it on the podcast, in, in addition to decompressing, the main reason why I'm doing functional fitness right now is I, I joke by saying that I want to get myself off the toilet when I'm 85 or 90 years old by myself, but it's really about independence and functionality later on, which is sort of an extension of what you just said. You're doing the fitness now in order to enjoy the stuff that you can decompress and then have a quality of life. And Unfortunately, as we get a little bit older, you can't do as much as you wanted to do. But I think sometimes people maybe give up a little bit too early. I don't know. <laughs> so. I, I agree completely. And, um, you know, you, you have to, I certainly have to sort of just slightly lower my targets on my physical stuff as I've, as I've got older and the recovery takes a little bit longer, unfortunately. 
and um, you know, I get very frustrated by it, but I uh, I try and smile through it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I can't do like a seven and a half mile minute mile in a five k anymore, which was probably or a seven minute mile might have been my uh, my record back many decades ago. Well, awesome. Um, what are your future plans? Continue the VC sewing or become a professional kayak instructor? Or... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've got a, I've got another sort of, um, you know, at least, uh, at least five, perhaps seven or eight more years in front of me, and um, I, I can't quite say what I've got in front of me, but it's um, going to be um, pushing my passion for helping companies reduce their risk, and I'm hopeful that it will center on this whole concept of just improving the automation and deployment of, of, of good configs into public cloud. Um, so we might, we might have something more to announce in a couple of weeks time, but um, you know, at the moment that's, that's about it. Awesome. Well, we, if, if it's something that you want to come back and talk about on the podcast, that's always open, open, open invitation right there. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I appreciate uh, the time. I also appreciate your flexibility. I know we've gone back and forth on trying to schedule this. Both of our schedules have been a little bit difficult, but glad to have gotten it in in the afternoon. And actually, right after this, I'm going to go out and run because that's what I do sometimes. So thank you very much. Enjoy the afternoon, son. It's certainly gorgeous up here in Cincinnati, and it looks like it's nice down there with you. So yeah, It's uh, gorgeous in Franklin, Tennessee, too. So. All right, everybody, stay secure.